Open in your Bibles to the book of Hebrews 11.4. One of the places that Lisa and I went in Washington was the Smithsonian Institute and uh, numbers of museums. One of these is the American History uh, Museum. This is a, one, of the, one of the plaques in the museum that caught my eye. And uh, it is talking about the history of money and money in general. But on there, they had this plaque money talks and that caught my eye because I knew that I was going to preach uh, from this passage and this is a real truth money talks the scripture that we are going to read it speaks about examples of faith and the very first example of faith that is given it speaks about an offering and one of the things that it says in the verse that we're about to read is that the impact of our giving goes on. Abel's offering still speaks, or in other words, God knew this principle, money talks. That's what I want to preach about, money talks from Hebrews chapter 11. If you want to read with me just one verse, I'm going to be reading from the New Century Version. It says, by faith... It was by faith that Abel offered God a better sacrifice than Cain did. God said he was pleased with the gifts Abel offered and called Abel a good man because of his faith. Abel died, but through his faith, he is still speaking. Money talks. Let's begin. The first thought I want to look at is the thought that money talks to God. One of the earliest examples of, of obedience is the one that we just read, and it had to do with the area of finances. In those days, there was no such thing as cash. Your flocks, your herds, they were your wealth. And God had given instruction about what was an acceptable offering according to him. Genesis 3.21, and to Adam and his wife did God... The Lord God make coats of skins and clothe them. This is the first animal sacrifice that we see in the Bible. God is saying, this is what I want. We understand it's symbolic looking ahead to Jesus Christ. But the point is, God set the terms. He didn't say, bring me anything you want. He made it clear what was acceptable and so it had a higher purpose than simply uh, uh, meeting a need. By what God tells us to give, it showed whether or not you agreed that he is God. We call this lordship. Do you believe that God is God and you are not? And God built into this system of offerings a very simple way to tell it had to do with the giving of an offering. Because money is connected to our hearts. And God has planned from the beginning of time that money is the way that we show whether we agree with his lordship. God's plan, as I said in those days, God told them what to give. He didn't leave it up to them. This is true for you and I. In our time, God, his plan for lordship is called tithing, giving the first 10% of our income. Exodus 23, 19, the first of the first fruits of your lamb, you shall bring into the house of the Lord your God. This scripture is referencing in Hebrews back to what you can read in Genesis chapter 4. We see there is something in the heart of people that we feel it is okay to alter God's instructions. Cain and Abel's parents, Adam and Eve, God had set a pattern from the beginning. Do not touch my tree. It doesn't explain why. You can eat from every other tree. Don't touch that one. Because that is the way you're going to show me whether you agree I'm God, you're not. We understand they took of the tree. They modified God's commands. Cain is Abel's brother. When they come to offer an offering, Abel does what God said, 
bring an animal, but Cain was a farmer. He brings vegetables. It's a lot easier to replace vegetables than it is to replace a lamb. So Cain thought, I see no problem lowering the cost. But what he didn't understand is that money talks. Money speaks. When he brings vegetables instead of what God said, he actually is telling God something. He is telling God, you're not God in my life. I am the God of my life. I know what's better uh, for me. Genesis 4, verse 5, but God did not accept Cain and his gift. In the year 2000, the average non-churchgoer gave 1.3% of their income to charity. That's people who are not Christians. The problem is the average churchgoer gave 2.3%. So that spirit of Cain is still going on to this day. People feel the right to modify, no, I can't afford that. No, I don't like that amount. And so I don't feel like obeying God, which is tithing the first 10% of our income. But in the scripture that we read, uh, just read, Abel believed God. So he obeyed. Genesis 4, 4, Abel brought the best parts from some of the firstborn of his flock. Money talks. It is sh it's a practical way of showing God what you think of him. Got a picture here. Goodwill is asking people to not donate junk. This is a picture of some of the junk that people leave outside of Goodwill. Goodwill spokesperson Heather Steves held up a lampshade, stained, disgusting, and literally falling apart. Another was a small table missing a leg. Someone donated purple food storage container, containers and a used sponge. Very useful to have a used sponge. They said, here's the rule. If you wouldn't give it to your judgmental mother-in-law, don't donate it to Goodwill. <laughs> Here, I want to donate. I want to help people in need. But this is what I think. You see, money talks. That is exactly what happens in every offering. Money talks to God. And it shows us what we think of God. Our text connects giving to God with faith. Verse four, by faith, Abel offered to God a more excellent sacrifice in Cain than Cain. Whether or not you obey God in finances will tell God whether you believe him or not. Tithing is a practical test of trust. It is trusting God that I'll do better on 90% of my income than I would if I kept uh, 100% for myself. And I want to say, if you can't believe God for tithing, you're not going to be able to believe God for anything else. There are people, I, they would love to have a powerful miracle ministry. They would love to have God do incredible things and uh, save thousands of people at the same time. But the starting point is the tithe because it's faith. If you cannot believe in the area of tithe, you will not believe God for anything else. There was a man, he was having trouble with the concept of tithing. Didn't think he could afford it. So he went to the pastor. He said, I'm struggling. You're, you're saying 10% of my... He said, I just don't think that I can afford it. And the pastor said, what if I said, why don't you try to tithe for two months, and at the end of two months, if you wind up being short, I will personally make up the difference. And the man said, well, well, based on that, yeah, I, I guess I could try tithing. And the pastor said, isn't that amazing? You are more willing to trust the word of a man than almighty God. Because that is what tithing is, Money talks to God. Let's look secondly, money talks to others. In our text, an offering is connected to salvation and redemption. Verse 4, by faith, 
Abel offered to God a more excellent sacrifice. I quoted before, Adam and Eve, the first sacrifice in the Bible, was a sacrifice to cover Adam and Eve for their sin. So Abel, understanding that, when he gives, he is giving for salvation. In other words, he is connecting himself to God's pattern of salvation to connect with God so that he can be forgiven. The, the point for you and I is not that we pay for our salvation. The actual point is that our giving enables salvation to be brought to other people. One of the things we do if you are visiting with us this morning is we are a church planting church. From our congregation, we have planted hundreds of churches all over the world. We, everything in, from our fellowship started here. We started, the first church was Wickenburg, Arizona, Tucson, Arizona, and then we began to spread out, and those churches began to plant, and now we have about 3,300 churches around the world. But I want to say, Planting new churches, it takes money. You have to understand that, Romans 10, 15. And how shall they preach except they be sent? We train couples in this congregation and then we launch them into cities where we do not have churches and it takes money. We don't just clap them on the back and say, let us know how you go. We pay their moving expenses. We pay ongoing personal support depending on their situation. We pay for their buildings so that they have a place to meet. We pay for special outreaches and events. When they go to conference we pay their way so they're, they're able to attend conference but what I want you to understand is that our giving changes lives it's not just paying bills we are reaching people's lives making impact let's go through I'm just going to quickly uh, shotgun through some of the churches that are under support all the churches you're going to see here, we either support partially or fully. Sarasota, Florida. We have some photos here. These are some movie outreaches. The equipment, everything there that enabled that outreach, we paid for from our congregation. In these outreaches, they had uh, almost 200 visitors, 35 people saved. Here's a young man that got saved in Sarasota, Dario Martinez. He was addicted to meth got saved. Here he's getting baptized and now you see him on the streets telling other people how they can be set free by Jesus Christ. St. Lucia in the Caribbean, Heath and Renee Flitcroft. Here's a lady named Linda. You see her on the right there. Linda was literally asking God, how can I find you? Renee invited her out on a Saturday outreach, came the next service, hasn't missed anything, doesn't matter what's going. She's fruitful, bringing friends. This is one of her friends that she brought. Some of the other people in the congregation, some of which were brought by her, that's St. Lucia in the Caribbean, Tampa, Florida. Uh, here are the Rosas's is that they recently did an outreach. This is their outreach at the local Walmart. A lady got a flyer. She came and got saved. That Sherry, later on her husband, came and got saved. Jose and Sherry and their family are now saved in Tampa, Florida. Ali Olur in India. This is a lady named Gioti. She's a, a Hindu lady came because uh, she was having problems with her sons who were addicted to alcohol. Another lady told her about how God was moving in her family. So she came, she had uh, pain uh, uh, in her knee, severe pain, deaf in both ears. After prayer, this lady received a miracle of healing. Here is some of the congregation in Arialur in India. Lalitpur in Nepal. This is part of Kathmandu in, in Nepal. Here's a work. Gordon and Mary Porter started this congregation. And now Sanjay Tripathi and his wife are pastoring it, have taken this over. Here they are. There's an outreach at the back. 
I was uh, in India. These are all people from that church in Lalitpur, and we help support that congregation. Camp Verde, Arizona, just over the hill, is uh, the Johns. This is the Johnny Cash outreach that did it in a, in a local hall. Had uh, more than 60 people out, 40 visitors came. They had four people saved and four people healed on that outreach. This man, Tony, is a tribal elder of the Yavapai Apache tribe, got saved in a revival that we sponsored with John Valtiera. He's been bringing friends and family. Said last Wednesday, they were about to close the church or the service on a Wednesday night, and Tony had invited four people. They showed up, so they started service again, and all four of them got saved. Thank God. In Taichung, Taiwan. Uh, we have uh, here the Swartzes are laboring there in Taiwan. This lady, uh, Rebecca and her son Ziv, they were invited to an English class. Uh, while on outreach, started coming to church. She had a heart disease that she was diagnosed with, uh, told that she needed surgery. They prayed for her. She uh, scheduled an appointment, and uh, uh, when I received the report, it said that a specialist said, now she does not need surgery, everything looks normal. Here's Ansira Bay, Madagascar, in Africa. In the next photo is, uh, you see the boy at the front there, that boy was healed of leprosy. They prayed for him and God did a miracle. Ansira Bay used to be a leper colony. That is what it was uh, in there. Uh, in the, uh, the photo there, that young man, you see Sitraka, Satraka was an orphan. There's almost one million orphans in Madagascar. He was living on the streets. Most people have to turn to crime and immorality to survive. He came and got saved, has never missed a church service, never missed an outreach. He now has a job. He lives in a home for the first time. And he said for the first time in his life at church, he now has a church family. Here's a rally they just did on the weekend. We have planted numbers of churches and they have planted churches. These are all pastors. And that is the rally that uh, went on just last weekend in Madagascar. Grassy Park in South Africa. Here's the Pepiches, Brandon and Andrea is uh, they did an outreach recently. This is a disciples healing crusade that he did outdoors. There's heaven's gates and hell's flames that they did. 150 people got saved. People still saved. They did a baptism uh, last Sunday. Two ex-Muslims. Grassy Park is a Muslim area and two ex-Muslims. Uh, one of these is getting baptized right there. There's a, a disciple doing an outreach, a healing outreach on the street in South Africa. Kathmandu, Nepal, is uh, this lady, Serju, was raised as a Hindu. She said, I used to go to the temple every Saturday and wondered why I didn't feel peace. I said, if, there is, if God is here, I surely would find peace, but you weren't allowed to ask that. Uh, those questions at the, at the temple. She felt the urge to go to church. One day she passed by the potter's house in Kathmandu, came in and got saved. She says, after coming to church, now I found my peace. Kimberly in South Africa. Uh, these are uh, Naaman and Don Strucker pastoring there. Here are outreaches that they uh, do in the uh, neighborhoods, uh, various outreaches of all kinds. They recently did a seven-year anniversary service uh, uh, and had 34 people saved. Here you see in schools, very, very open in schools, that you're able to preach. There's a, a boys' high school at the bottom, girls' high school at the top, people getting saved because of the investment there. I think they have one, one more picture, this uh, family here. Uh, the, the kids started coming and got saved, started inviting their parents. Their parents saw such a change in their children. They came and got saved, and now this entire family are saved and living for Jesus there in Kimberley, uh, South Africa. Vientiane in the nation of Laos. Uh, here is uh, the pastor. He's uh, doing a great work there. The Philippines are laboring. Last week, he went out in the countryside, and a family said, 
can you come pray for this man? And when he looked down, he realized this man was out of his mind. They had him chained to try to control him. He kept saying to Pastor Philippi, I need medicine to help me. Tom told him the best medicine is to know you're right with God and that he loves, loves you. He prayed for him, and when he finished, he said, the man said in perfect English, thank you very much. When everybody saw the change in the man, everybody in the village started clapping because God had done a miracle there. Mazatlan in Mexico, here's Roberto and Carmen Rojo, is there laboring there. This is a revival with uh, Pastor Diego Galvan. When he went, here is some of the church that you see. There's a lady that came in to the revival uh, and uh, the lady at the bottom, she got saved in the revival of Pastor Galvan, completely healed. She was living with a man. She said, I want to do it right, has separated, and they're now going to get married in church and make their uh, relationship right. This family at, to uh, at the top, Carmen Rojo, the pastor's wife, witnessed to this lady at her daughter's school and told her how God had done a miracle in Roberto and Carmen's uh, marriage. This woman began to weep and said, today was the day I was going to leave my husband and now you're telling me about restoration. She came and got saved. Her husband got saved the following week and now the entire family is saved and living for God. Bukramanga, thank God for that. Amen. Amen. Bukaramanga in the nation of Colombia. There's a, an outreach. On that outreach, 19 people were saved. Uh, and the bottom, that lady there, her son had been murdered. She wanted to kill herself because of grief. But her and her daughter got saved while he was preaching at a local park. The man on the right, David, was an alcoholic, attempted suicide because of depression, and now all of them are saved, and that is in the nation of Columbia. Fort Myers, Florida, here's Matt and Chrissy Sanger laboring there. They've been able to come back finally to their building that was destroyed after the hurricane. Here's a revival at the, at the top with a Mike Major, and they're uh, laboring uh, uh, for God. They're seeing people get saved. In the Solomon Islands, Adrian and Emily uh, Martinez are laboring there. This is actually one of their baby churches in an area called White River. They did an uh, outdoor healing crusade, and uh, numbers of people got saved. Numbers of people were healed there. Siem Reap, Cambodia. Uh, here, uh, Tom and Chrissy Kenyon are laboring there. And uh, that man you see on the left, Damau. Before the church even opened, he walked into the yard. Tom witnessed to him, and he got saved. He spoke enough English that Tom asked him if he would be willing to be a translator. He said he reluctantly agreed. A few weeks later, his wife, Seon, she came and got saved. Then his best friend, Vyazna, who was an alcoholic, got saved and delivered from alcohol. Vyazna said, my wife will never serve Jesus because her parents live across the street and they will never let her leave Buddhism. But he said, just love your wife and, and serve Jesus. His wife came and got saved. Then their three teenagers all got saved. Vyazna's drinking buddy, Fiorun, uh, he's the man on the right there. Fiorun uh, could not believe what happened to him. He said, why would you leave drinking? I like drinking. I will never stop drinking. But then Firun came with his children to see what did his friends get involved in. Firun got converted, also delivered from alcohol. Then his wife got saved. There's a, an altar call in a regular service, baptism. This is in Siem Reap in Cambodia. Juba in South Sudan. Here, this is a building. There was nothing there, an empty lot. There are no, this is a desperately poor nation. There are no buildings to rent. And so we had to build a building there. You see there the grass uh, thatch roof and, and uh, that kind of wall. This is where they're laboring. Here's uh, uh, the Neris are laboring there. And uh, God is doing miracles in Juba in the nation of South Sudan. Those are just a few of the places where our giving, when we give, we take pledges, we take offerings, we are sending it and people's lives are being changed. 
Not only are people's lives being changed, what we do literally determines whether people wind up in heaven or in hell. El Dorado Park, South Africa is where the Bannets were. Lisa and I pioneered there. The Bannets uh, uh, pastored. Now the Heimbergs are there. This lady, Lisa, got saved on an outreach led by a disciple, got prayed for when J.W. did a revival, J.W. Ballinger. She came to church for one and a half months faithfully, and then she had a stroke and she died. That lady is in heaven today because we gave. That is what money does. Money doesn't just talk to God. Money tells people in the world there is hope. And when we give, the scripture that we read said, by faith. You know what we do when we give? I come, sometimes you can see the people stand here on a Thursday night. Sometimes you just see pictures on a screen. These are places most of you will never go yourself. But by faith, we believe, we send these couples, we finance them. We are giving by faith that people will be saved. And I've just shown you literal people that have been saved. Churches that will be established. And we've just seen that disciples are made. The whole point of our fellowship we plant churches to reach sinners, get them saved, and then disciple them, train them, and send them out. Remember before I showed you a picture of Ansirabe, Madagascar. We, we invested there. This is a, a couple, Bruno uh, and his wife, very long name, I'm not going to try to say it now. Uh, Rem, <laughs> Rem Panariva is their last name. This couple were saved in the church, discipled, and I think it was last conference, this couple was now sent out. That is what we do. When we're giving to places that we might never go ourselves, but by faith that God is going to touch people like that, these are the answer to Madagascar. In every nation, we plant churches to make disciples so that one day they can reach their own people. Final thought, let's talk about money not only talks to God and to people, money talks for us. Our scripture says, when you have faith and you demonstrate that by giving, God says, your offerings speak. Now what it says is that God speaks on our behalf. Verse 4, by faith Abel offered to God a better sacrifice than Cain did. God said he was pleased with the gifts Abel offered, called Abel a good man because of his faith. Listen to this, Abel died, but through his faith he is still speaking. Most scholars believe that when he came and laid down his offering, fire came out of heaven. In other words, God was showing, I accept your offering, I like this. For you and I, there is a tangible dimension of blessing. When we agree with God, God, you told us where to start in giving, that's tithing, I agree. When we respond by faith in offerings and pledges and world evangelism offerings to plant churches overseas, in the same way, something supernatural happens. That is the point. It is not just we paid the bills. When he offered that sacrifice, something supernatural happened, things changed. That is what happens when people obey God and by faith they give to God, Malachi 3.10, bring the whole tithe into the storehouse that there may be food in my house. Test me in this, says the Lord Almighty. See if I will not throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out the, uh, so much blessing that you will not have room enough for it. Acts 10.4, when he observed him, he said, what is it, Lord? And he said to him, your prayers 
and your giving have come up for a memorial before God. You see, you will have needs. We normally take these pledges every six months. In the next six months, I can almost guarantee you're going to have needs. I can almost guarantee you will have problems. I'm not trying to be Debbie Downer. I just know life. You're going to have problems in your life in one way. And probably, if you're smart, you will pray. God, in this problem, I need help. But the Bible says God doesn't just listen to your prayers. He looks at your giving. Because remember... Your money talks. It talks to God. And a miracle dimension in prayer is connected to liberality in uh, in money. In our scripture, it says, our giving can speak beyond beyond us. He died, our text said, and yet he is still speaking. This is what we want in life. We want to connect our lives to an eternal purpose. That the impact lives on. That the impact will still be producing. Matthew 6 20, lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven. You know what? We can be eternally remembered and eternally Rewarded. Lisa and I were just in Washington, D.C., fascinating place. We went to all kinds of different places. Ford's Theater, where Lincoln was assassinated, went to Mount Vernon, George Washington's home. We saw different monuments to heroes of the founding of our nation. But I want to speak to you about a different hero you might not have heard of. Put his picture up. This man's name is Robert Morris. This man is probably not as well known as George Washington or uh, Thomas Jefferson. He was one of the signers of the Declaration of Independence. He was a senator from Pennsylvania. But Robert Morris was a businessman and he staked his future on the United States. When they said they're going to go to war, He knew they're going to need a navy. They had no ships. America had no ships. He sold one of his ships. It became the first ship in the U.S. Navy. This man, Robert Morris, became known as the most powerful man in America, the financier of the revolution. When Washington's troops had not been paid, they didn't have any system of taxation to raise money, Robert Morris loaned 10,000 pounds it was in those days to pay Washington's troops so that they could keep fighting for independence. This kept them together just before the battles of Trenton and Princeton. During the Revolutionary War, Robert Morris lost 150 of his ships because of the consequences of the war. He never asked for reimbursement. He arranged supplies when states couldn't afford it. He paid for it and sent supplies. When the government was bankrupt during the war, Robert Morris personally loaned $1.4 million back in those days to fund the entire army. I don't know what Robert Morris left to his family, but Robert Morris did leave something important, the United States. We are the beneficiaries because Robert Morris, being dead, still speaks. He saw by faith what America could become, and he said, I'm in. With his finances, he invested, and so there is something that outlives him. Our text says, your money talks to God, Your money talks to people who are not saved and your money talks for you. So the question is, 
what does your money say about you? Cheapskate. Is that what it says? <laughs> or does it say, you agree with God in his plan, and you are a man or a woman of faith because money talks. Let's bow our heads. Close our eyes all across this place. Thank God. While our heads are bowed now, I want to give an opportunity uh, <clears throat> to every person that is here who, first of all, is not right with God. The most important thing that you can save to God, you can say to God, I agree with what you say about my sin. I said early in the sermon, when Adam and Eve first sinned, the very first thing that God did is something had to die. It was blood had to be paid to pay for sin so sin could be covered. And this is true for you and I. My challenge this morning is that you need to believe God and what he says about sin. The Bible says, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. If you are here this morning, if you're not right with God, I want to give you an opportunity. What you need to do is be honest with God and say, God, I agree. I am a sinner. I have broken your commands. I've lived in rebellion against your will and your rule in my life. But God, I believe in Jesus Christ, the ultimate blood sacrifice. Jesus shed his blood so you can go free. And if you're here this morning and you're not right with God, I want to give you an opportunity. You can pray. You can say, God, I want to live for you. I want to turn from my sin. You saw people on the screen that God set them free from drugs and alcohol. God changed their life, restored their marriage, gave them peace of mind. That only happened when they dealt with their sin problem. How many people are here this morning, you are not right with God, and you want to pray for God to forgive you of your sins. You want to live for God. If that's what you want, I want you to lift up your hand right now. How many would there be? Pastor Greg, I'm not right with God. I know that. Here's my hand. I need Jesus. Hold it up high. Say, I'm not saved, and I want to turn from my sin. I want to live for Jesus all across this place. How many would there be? I want to get right with God. Some of you are backslidden. You were saved, but you turned your back on God. Backslider, lift up your hand right now. God loves you. He wants to do a miracle inside of you. He wants to change you from the inside out. Thank God. Then I want to change the, the service. And the first thing I want to do, your money talks to God. I spoke about the issue of tithing. You are here this morning and God spoke to you. Maybe you're, you have the same spirit of Cain. You have been changing God's rules. You've been changing what you think is acceptable. Maybe you say, I can't afford that, or things are tight right now, or I'll give later on when I have more. But you are telling God, not simply about your finances, you're telling God what you think of him. Some of you need to fix that. You need to begin to tithe. And I'm asking, first of all, how many of you here, you are not a tither, and while God spoke to you in this message, you say, Pastor Greg, I want to start tithing this morning, giving the first 10% of my income by faith. I'm going to believe God that he's going to help me. If you're not a tither and you're going to begin, lift up your hand. How many would there be all across this place as God would deal? Hold your hand up so I can see it. Thank you. People are lifting their hands. God bless you. Other people, you say, I'm going to start tithing. I'm going to start obeying God. Lift up your hand right now. Other people, you want to respond. Thank you. There are people that are here. You are hit or miss. You tithe and then a bill comes and you stop. You tithe and then you need something. You stop. God wants regular faithful obedience. How many of you say, I have 
been a tither in the past, but I'm not faithful. I'm going to begin to be faithful in the area of the tithe. Lift up your hand. How many would there be all across this place? As God would deal with people. Thank you. Thank you. People are responding. They're getting right with God. I'm going to tithe and do right before God. Thank God for all of these people. Right now, God, I'm asking that you minister. Oh, God, open their eyes. Bring conviction right now. Cause people to respond in obedience so you can help them. In Jesus' name, amen. I want you all to look up. I, I preach this uh, message. And <clears throat> part of this message is we challenge every six months. We have an ongoing, uh, off the top of my head, it's somewhere near 27 churches, I think, at any given time that we support fully or partially. Here in America, we have a number of works that we support. Internationally, we have more than 20, I think about 23 or so uh, uh, that we support overseas. There are people that they are, week after week, they are laboring for God, only made possible because we give. The only way that that can happen is we need God's people to say, I'm in. I, I want to in connect myself to something larger than me, larger than my family. I want to enable God's work to go out into all of these different places. This is not all of the churches that I mentioned. That's not all of the churches that we support to, to some degree. But I am challenging you right now to make a decision for a pledge. They have, a, they're going to put on the screen, we have a, a, a pledge and uh, I want you to quickly pass these out. They're going to start to pass them out. You can tell us about the pledge that you're going to give. And I'm asking, this is for the next six months. You can either do this on a piece of paper. You can join uh, with me. You have there a lump sum. Maybe it is you're going to put in a lump sum all at one time. Then you would put it there. If you're going to give weekly, you don't have to fill out all four of these uh, if you're giving weekly, you get paid weekly, that'd be fine. Or you get paid every two weeks, you get paid once a month, then whatever line is appropriate, you don't have to total it. Just to, All this does is give us an idea of how uh, much that helps us to plan. The other ways that you can do this is by text. You see the number there, 928-379-0984. We don't need your name, don't care about that. All we need is the number uh, or the, uh, the money amount and then the time frame. Is that lump sum? Is that weekly, bi-weekly, or monthly? And, uh, or you can email. Any of these ways, I'm asking you to make a decision that you are going to give in uh, one of these ways. And then this is how we are going uh, to support and we're going to make it possible to give. Amen. I'm going, I want you to bow your heads just for a moment. I'm going to ask God to speak. This is one of the things I believe in money. It's not simply a matter of whatever we have laying around. It is to ask God. And I'm going to ask right now, I'm going to ask God to speak. Holy Spirit, I pray that you would put amounts in people's minds right now. God, it's not my job to tell them how much to give. It's yours. And I'm asking, Lord God, you would cause faith to rise. As you speak an amount, let there be a spirit of obedience to the faith. And God, I pray that you would trigger a miracle dimension as people would obey you. Speak to them about amounts, lump sums, ongoing support, and what you want them to give. Amen. Then I want you to do that. I want you to take a moment to write that down to text that, to email that, however you're going to do it. I want you to do that. I want the ushers to come. They're going to put some uh, offering plates at the front. And uh, what I want you to do, in addition to that, I'm asking that you join with me, not only in a pledge, if you have some uh, 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 cash as well, that you could come and give 
Today, if you're giving in a paper pledge, I want you to come and join with me. We're going to put these in the offering plates. We are going on record before God. The vision that he has given us, God, I am all in. I want to be a part of what you're doing. And I am going to believe God that in the next six months, in the crises of life, in the needs and the things you're praying, I am going to pray that God would speak for you, that he would intervene on your behalf and bring blessing. Let's bow our heads right now. God, I'm asking for a miracle dimension. I need miracle supply for your work. And then I need miracle supply for your people. God, as people give by faith, release miracle jobs, jobs that have sufficient salary. God, jobs that have benefits, jobs that the hours enable them to do your will. God, I pray that you are going to trigger miracles in their lives, salvation of loved ones, increase in their ministry and fruitfulness, all the things that you want to do. God, I thank you in advance for everything you're going to do through our giving in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. They're going to sing, and I'm inviting you. Let's all stand up to our feet. I'm inviting you to come. Let's join together in putting our pledges in and also giving to God. They're going to sing right now. <clears throat> he paid a debt he did not owe. I owe a debt I could not pay. I needed someone to wash my sins away. And now I sing a brand new song, Amazing Grace. Hallelujah. Christ Jesus paid a debt that I could, could never, never pay. pay. He, he paid, paid a debt he did not owe. I, I owe a debt, debt I could not, not pay. pay. I needed someone to wash my sins away and now i see a brand new song amazing grace christ jesus paid a debt that i could never pay he paid a debt he paid a debt he did not owe, I, I owe a debt. debt. I could not pay, I needed someone to wash my, my sins, sins away. But now I sing a brand new song, Amazing Grace. Christ Jesus paid the debt that I could never pay. And let's praise God together right now. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah, Lord God, hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus, for your goodness. Praise God. I am so grateful to all of you that uh, join with uh, Lisa and I in giving. For the work of God, I, I, as I was getting the emails and looking at these photos and sorting through them, what we're involved in is incredible. And just to think, the photos that you saw there, uh, I have a part. I'm, this is not just something I'm telling you to do. Lisa and I, we give right along with you. We tithe right along with you. We have a part of what God is doing all over the world, from Prescott, Arizona, simply because we obey God and give by faith. I'm telling you, that is, that is incredible that he lets us be a part of it. Thank God. We're going to be...